to do with everything else in that chapter and everything in the previous chapter. We're still talking about the spirits in prison, the Gentile church maturing and coming out of all this reveling and parting and rioting and all the things that he's mentioning here. We're talking about the church growing up. Let me read to you. You can't see it from there. You might be able to. This is out of Kittle's Dictionary of New Testament Greek Words. It's a ten-volume set. It's got this much to say on telos, teleo, epiteleo, suntaleo, suntalia, pontales, pontales, teleos, teleates. These are all forms of the same word. And he's talking about telos here on the front end of it. Telos. This is what the word means. Achievement. It's the first thing out of the hat. It doesn't mean the end. Was Jesus the end of the law? Did he end the law? Our word end does not correlate with the word telos. Achievement. Execution of a resolve. The Gentile church is going to execute a resolve to grow up and become mature, aren't they? To add execution, when you execute something, you follow through with it, don't you? We're carried out. Success. These are words that telos means. It don't mean the end of something. It's really a bad translation. On the basis of discharging an official task, the word means, the word comes to mean the office itself. It means to fulfill an office. On the other side, telos means completion as a state of perfection. Be ye therefore perfect. Be ye grown up. If we don't leave the principles of the doctrines of faith and go on unto perfection or completion, we end up putting Christ in open shame. It's talking about growing up and maturing it has nothing to do with preterism. I had a, some guy used to come here and he, I heard him on radio, I'm going to explain this verse in verse Peter, the fourth chapter, and how it's about the end of all things. And he claims to believe in preterism. And he don't have any idea what he's talking about. You guys need to stop that. You want to come back here? I ain't going to hold it against you. Just come back here and sit down in the back and be quiet and behave yourself. Listen. People think God is kind of erratic. He's kind of a little bit wacky sometimes. Don't they? That God just goes off in space. He's talking along. Everything in this book is talking about the same thing. The strangers in the first verse. The spirits in prison. Suffering in the second chapter. Christ suffering for us. Giving us an example to go out and suffer for others. And grow up and become mature. The fourth chapter is about the maturity of the Gentile church or the spirits in prison church or those who are in darkness learning to grow up and be mature. Now, let me just give you a couple other things he's got in this definition. Execution, goal, result, reward, conclusion, finally, forever. Completely. Tell us becomes a term of completeness. It's not talking about the end of all prophecy is here. I hate that. To understand telos and teleo, it is important to keep in view the original dynamic character of the noun. What Concerns me must actually be carried out or fulfilled. It's talking about the church growing up and being fulfilled. The sense end as conclusion and antithesis to commencement. It's talking about, it's an opposite, antithesis, antithesis means it's opposition to commence. Commence means to begin and tell us means to complete and to grow up and become mature. That's what this is talking about. In fact, go back over. That'll be enough I read out of this. It, and none of it means to 
finish up, final, do it our way with it. It, it. They also have in here, it means an act of initiation. Now, go back to the first chapter in verse 10. He's talking about the strangers. Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now notice the words here. The prophets prophesied of the grace that should come unto who? The strangers? Yes. But wait a minute. The prophets in the Old Testament, they didn't have to prophesy of the grace that should come to the Jews. It was there, wasn't it? They already had the grace. He can't be talking about Jewish believers here. He has to be talking about Gentile believers, which are spirits in prison. He has to be talking about them because he says, this grace, the prophets prophesied that it should come to you strangers. Isaiah prophesied all through his writings that the Gentiles would come to the light, didn't he? 42.6. All through it. I love that. He's prophesying the Gentiles will come. This verse right here shows he's talking to Gentiles, doesn't it? And he's talking about the Gentiles growing up and maturing. Let's go over here to chapter 4. Let's go to chapter 4. Now I've got every time the word, every time the word telos is used in Scripture, i got it here. And it just doesn't mean it doesn't mean that it's the finality that all prophecy is over with. It's talking about a maturity. It's talking about a cessation of growing up and becoming grown. It's the only way it can be a cessation would be a cessation of be a cessation of these things that he says in this chapter. Now look at chapter 4 verse 1. For as much then and you're still talking about the spirits in prison God's not changing the subject. You're still talking about the spirits in prison from the previous chapter. For as much, that is a conjunction, that's, it is a it's a dependent it's a uh, subordinate conjunction that connects the previous thought in the previous chapter with what's about to be said. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. That's exactly what he says in verse 18 of the previous chapter. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Verse 1 of chapter 4, For Christ has suffered for us in the flesh. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. So he's telling us, grow up and mature, as a Gentile church, as a stranger's church, I need to read stranger to you. Let me read this to you. This comes out of Hastings Encyclopedia. Stranger. Stranger, stranger. Both these words have shades of meaning in the authorized version which are now almost obsolete in our society. See, it doesn't mean stranger when we say stranger. And they're also used to represent various Hebrew terms whose significations are materially distinct. On the other hand, the word strange had a connotation in modern English which it never possesses in the Old Testament and very rarely in the New Testament. Hence, in many passages, considerable confusion which might have been obviated by a change of rendering in the in the RV revised version is produced in the mind of the English reader. Strange and stranger mean in a great many instances simply foreign. I think that's what Gentiles were, weren't they? Foreigners. It just meant a foreigner. By the way, that's the very same meaning of the word barbarian. Originally barbarian meant a foreigner. He says, stranger didn't mean something that's weird. It meant a foreigner. And let me see here. It would conduce to clearness if in a great majority of instances where, as in all the above Old Testament passages except 
Exodus 12:45, as noted, derivatives of the root are employed. The renderings foreign and foreigner were adopted. Thus, we should have foreigners or for sons of foreignness. And he goes through all of this and says the same rendering would reproduce in Genesis 31, 15, but here perhaps in a narrow sense of not of one's father's family, thy brother who cometh from a distant land defined by who is not of the children of Israel. It just meant someone's foreign, not of Israel. So when he's writing to the strangers, he's talking about this is the five-volume set of Hastings, and I could read on here. I just wanted you to understand it meant a foreigner that's not of the children of Israel. So when he says strangers, he's talking about Gentiles where this was hidden through the ages, and he's talking about the Gentiles or the spirits in prison. God doesn't start the subject of the spirits in prison when he gets to verse 18 and 19. He starts the subject of the spirits in prison in verse 1 of the book, doesn't he? By saying strangers. But see, if you don't look these things up, you're not going to know. Now, let's go back over here to chapter 4. Chapter 4 is about the maturity of the Gentile spirits in prison church, how it's going to grow up. All of the people that Paul wrote to, let's just read this. For as much then as Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. That reminds me of chapter 2, verse Chapter 2, verse 21. For even here unto where you call, because Christ also suffered for us, says the same thing when he says he suffered for sins in verse 18 of chapter 3, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, quickened by the Spirit, the means by which he'll preach to the spirits in prison. When well, he says in chapter 2, verse 21, For even here unto where you call, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example. Leaving Hupalampano means to bequeath after his death. So he bequeaths to us this example. He did no sin, we do no sin. The inner man can't sin. Neither was guile found in his mouth. We went out to have trickery in our mouth, not frowardness, not twisting words. Who, when he reviled, he reviled not again. We're not to revile again. This is, an, this is what's left to us. When he suffered, he threatened not. We don't threaten. We have the same mind as Christ. And he committed himself to him that judges righteously. We commit ourselves to him that judges righteously, who in his own self bear our sins in his body on the tree, that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. And by our stripes the dead elect will hear and be healed, because we arm ourselves with the same mind. So that's what he's saying in chapter 4, verse 1. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. When you cease from sin, you're growing up and maturing, aren't you? Isn't that right? Well, sure it is. You have an outer man and an inner man, the outer man. And you have an inner man. It's a little faith. And over the years, you've got all this jealousy and envy and strife and contention and forwardness and busy biting and gossip and tail bearing and all the rest of it. And over the years, as you go through fire, 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 we cease from sin, don't we? And all this fire burns out the sin in our life. It don't burn out every ounce of it, but you're ceasing. You're continually to cease from sin. But if you're ceasing from sin, you're maturing, aren't you? This chapter is about the church maturing or becoming complete telos and getting away from its sin. Well, if anybody knew about that, Peter did, didn't he? Getting away from his sin was a tough thing to do. How much time do I have? 23. All right, let me get on with this. I want to show you what we're talking about. I'm going to read through this and come back to it and show you some things about maturity. <clears throat> that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. That's maturing, isn't it? That's becoming completed and growing up. This is when he says down here, but the end of all things is near, but the completion of the church is near. The growing up is near. 